Hello everyone, and welcome to today's TechSoup webinar. And thank you for joining us. Today we'll be talking about ways you can help youth find a free meal this summer, whether you represent a nonprofit, a library, or faith-based organization, or even if you're an individual who's looking to make a difference in your community. Today we'll be using the ReadyTalk platform. Uh, please use the chat in the lower left corner to send questions and comments to the presenters. We'll be tracking your questions throughout the webinar, and we'll answer them at the designated Q&A section at the end. All of your chat comments will only come to the presenters, but if you have comments or ideas to share, we will forward them back out to the entire group. You do not need to raise your hand to ask a question. Simply type it into the chat box. Should you get disconnected during the webinar, you can reconnect using the same link in your confirmation email. You should be hearing the conference audio through your computer speakers. But if your audio connection is unclear, you can dial in using the phone number in your confirmation email. If you have technical issues, please send us a chat message and we will try to assist you. You can also call the ReadyTalk support number at, uh, listed on your screen. This webinar is being recorded today and will be archived on the TechSoup website. If you are called away from the webinar or if you have connection issues, you can watch a full recording of the webinar later. You will receive an archive email within 24 hours that will include a link to the recording, the PowerPoint slides, and any links shared during the session. If you are tweeting the webinar today, please use the hashtag TechSoup. We have someone from TechSoup live tweeting this event, so please join in the conversation there. Now TechSoup connects nonprofits, charities, libraries, and foundations with tech products and services, as well as information so that you can make informed decisions about technology. TechSoup has been around since 1987, and since then has distributed over 11 million technology donations to over 200,000 nonprofit organizations. In addition to offering products including the latest versions of software like Microsoft Windows and QuickBooks, TechSoup also offers consulting services. For more information about TechSoup products and services, please visit us online at TechSoup.org and click on Get Products and Services. You can also subscribe to the TechSoup newsletter to stay up to date on webinars, tech information, and new products and services available through TechSoup. With that, I'd like to welcome you once again to today's TechSoup webinar, Help Youth Find a Free Meal This Summer. Summer hunger is a serious issue affecting youth in our communities, and we are here to give you some tips on how to help get more youth fed this summer while school is out. My name is Crystal Schimpf, and I will be your host for today's webinar. And I'm joined by three guests who will be sharing information about the Summer Meals program and ways you can help more youth find summer meals in your area. Patrice Chamberlain is the Director of the California Summer Meal Coalition, which is a statewide collaborative effort dedicated to fighting youth hunger. Patrice will give us an overview of the Federal Summer Food Service Program and Summer Meals in California. Michael Cox is the Director of Public Services at the Pueblo City County Library District in Pueblo, Colorado. Michael is going to tell us how his library district helps youth find summer meals, both as a meal site and also as a referral agency. Last but not least, Marnie Webb is the CEO of Caravan Studios, which is a division of TechSoup Global. Caravan uses a collaborative approach to solving community problems using technology and recently launched the Range app, which helps locate summer meal sites. Marnie is going to tell us about several technology tools, including Range, that can be used to help connect youth with summer meals. Assisting us with chat, we have several folks from the TechSoup and Caravan teams, Becky Wiegand, Sarah Washburn, and Anna Yeager, who will be keeping track of your questions and joining you in the conversation. On Twitter, we have Jenny Meese under the te at TechSoup for Libs handle. And if you are on Twitter today, be sure to use the hashtag TechSoup to be involved in the conversation there. Today we'll be taking a broad look at the Summer Meal Program, starting off with a brief discussion of what it is and why it's important. We'll take a look at an example of how the Summer Meal Program integrates into library programming and how it can be promoted through library services. We'll look at several tools available to help find summer meal sites and talk about what you can do to help youth in your community. Our focus today is really on how to help get youth fed, regardless of whether or not your organization provides those meals directly. Uh, this is about ways we can make information available and make referrals and I hope that you all walk away with a few new ways to help youth in your community this summer. Please remember to submit any questions and comments in the chat throughout the webinar. We'll have time for questions and answers at the end, and we'll get to as many questions as we can during the webinar. We will follow up with you via email if we run out of time and your question was not answered. Your chat comments will come to us as presenters, but we'll share them back out with the entire group. Also, just a reminder that this webinar will be archived and sent to you via email after the webinar is completed. 
Now before we get started, uh, we'd like to know a little bit about you. So in this poll that you see on your screen, or you should be seeing on your screen, tell us what your level of knowledge is about the Summer Meal Program and about summer hunger issues in general. To respond to the poll, uh, s simply select the radio button next to the response that best fits. Are you an expert when it comes to summer meals? Do you have a fair amount of working knowledge about the program, or are you a novice here to learn? I'll give you a few seconds to respond to this poll, uh, and uh, so you get a chance to really think about it. And just pick the answer that uh, is, uh, represents you the best. And I'll give you a few more seconds. I can still see that responses are coming in. And I can see already that um, the majority are, are definitely new to the Summer Meals program and are here to learn today, which is great. You have come to the right place. All right, so I'm going to give a, just a countdown here. We'll close the poll in 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. And so now you should be able to see the results. And we can see that, that many of us are here to learn. Um, now I'm sure you have many other experiences involving youth and programming that you know, you'll be able to uh, relate to this information to today and think about how you can help with the Summer Youth Program. Now for those of you who are experts or who have a fair amount of information, please share your ideas and your experiences in the chat. And like I said, we'll share them back out with the entire group. Now another thing we'd like to know is, is how you have been involved in summer meal programs in the past. And in this one, you can actually select multiple responses, so select all that apply. Um, and this is looking at the past, so in years past 2013 or earlier, uh, have you served meals at your site? Uh, have you referred youth to other meal sites? Is this your first time getting involved? Or if you're selecting other, tell us in the chat what, uh, what it is you've done to be involved in summer meals in the past. And, um, and then we will put that out to the rest of the group. I know some of you may be involved for the first time this year, and that's okay. We're really just looking at the, the past today. Um, and this helps us know what your level of current experience is. So yeah, if you have other experiences, tell us in the chat, and we will share it back out with everyone. And it looks like the responses are slowing down here as well, so I'm going to give another little countdown to close the poll. 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. We'll close the poll. And again, we see a lot of first-time involvement, which makes sense based on the last question. Um, some of you have done other types of involvement, so hopefully we'll get to see some of your ideas as well. And, uh, and then quite a few of you, your involvement has been referring youth to meal sites, and hopefully these tools we share with you today will give you uh, some, some greater ideas on how to continue that service and improve on it. And so uh, thank you for telling us a little bit about yourself. And now I'm going to have Marnie tell us why summer meals are so important and introduce this topic to all of us. Marnie? Hi, thank you for the introduction, and hello everyone. Um, so as uh, Crystal explained a little bit in the opening, We've become, we at Caravan Studios have become engaged with the issue of summer meals. And Patrice Chamberlain is going to describe this just a little bit in more detail. But we did want to share with you the problem that first brought us into this issue area. We do community events called Generators where we worked with food rescue organizations. And we also interviewed and talked to county officials and librarians in the state of California. And, and, and we learned what was to us this startling fact that of for every six youth that take advantage of federally funded lunch programs during the school year, only one of them is accessing summer meals. It means five of those kids are facing food insecurity during the summer. And that food insecurity leads to a greater summer learning loss. And, and, and those youth gain weight two to three times as fast during the summer months. So we put that information together, this huge number of kids that weren't accessing the summer meals. and um, and, and the, the impacts of that food insecurity on their academics and on their health. And so we started asking ourselves as a team, how can we increase access to summer meals? And as, as part of asking ourselves that question, we also talked to people, Patrice Chamberlain among them, who gave us more insight in, in, into what it's like for these youth that are um, seeking summer meals and what the summer meals programs are like. And, and, and with that, I'll hand it off to you, Patrice. Thanks, Marnie. So as Marnie pointed out, there's a real disconnect between what's happening during the school year and what's happening in the summer. 
So what I'm hoping to do is expand a little bit on, on what's happening during the summer and how USDA summer meal programs provide an opportunity to really help build a summer safety net for kids in your community. It's, it's really more than just a meal. We're really talking about um, pooling together resources and, and building partnerships to create that infrastructure in summer. So what's happening when school's out? So, it, you know, it's safe to say that, that when school lets out for the summer, that, that the kids that are getting free and reduced place lunch during the school year, that need doesn't magically disappear during the summer. Um, and along with that, you know, food insecurity has has consequences related to the children's development, their cognitive, behavioral, and physical development. So um, really looking at both the individual consequences, but knowing that that ultimately is going to have longer-term impacts on the well-being and prosperity of our communities. So in addition to um, those individual impacts, it's harder for low-income families to make ends meet during the summer. You know, without access to the school lunch program, it's difficult for families to offset those costs that they were able to during the school year. So the national um, organization, Share Our Strengths, uh, last year conducted a survey of low-income parents and found that almost 40% um, had a harder time making ends meet during the summer, and that 34% of those families actually did not have enough food during the summer. So it, this is a, a, a really real problem that we're dealing with. Um, so summer creates, you know, as Marnie indicated earlier, it really creates um, a potential perfect storm of bad outcomes. We have the food insecurity piece. We have increased risk of childhood obesity. Um, as Marnie said, kids can gain weight two to three times faster during the summer than during the school year, um, which makes it more difficult for that weight to come off during the school year. Um, in addition, without kind of taking a holistic approach to uh, promoting nutrition, uh, that includes summer, we're also looking at how this can undermine the nutrition promotion efforts that are happening during the school year. So, you know, kids are year-round beings, so we really need to look at promoting healthy habits um, year-round as we work to create a, a healthier next generation. In addition to these health outcomes, there's also the, the impact of the summer learning loss. As many of you probably know whether you're working in a nonprofit or in a library, that summer learning loss can have um, a really big impact on low-income kids. Um, the National Summer Learning Association reports that uh, low-income kids not only are, are losing the grade level math skills that uh, other kids are experiencing, they're also experiencing an, a higher rate of reading skill, loss in reading skills as well. Um, and what this means is that, you know, there is the additional cost of reteaching in the fall and the cum cumulative impact that that has on the achievement gap. So summer presents a real opportunity for us to address both the health and the learning um, impacts on kids. So USDA summer nutrition programs um, are, provide a really amazing opportunity, I think, to do this. And I'm going to just provide a really, really basic overview of the program. Um, and I know that Crystal will share out more uh, specific details after the webinar. So the U.S. Department of Agriculture offers summer nutrition programs. You may have heard of it referred to as the Summer Food Service Program or the Seamless Summer Feeding Option. And that's just part of the school lunch program. And basically, the idea is to help ensure that low-income kids have access to a healthy meal during the summer, just to eliminate that gap that can happen when school closes. And typically, these meals are served in low-incomes that have a high population of low-income kids. But the benefit, too, is that um, all kids in the neighborhood can have a lunch. So there's no ID required or documentation. So um, it, it's a great opportunity to ensure that all kids have access um, to a healthy meal without any kind of stigma. And just to introduce you to a, a couple of terms that I might refer to, um, the sponsor is the agency that acts as the, the administrative agent. A lot of times it's the school district 
It could also be a nonprofit, such as a food bank or a church, too. And then the site is the place where the meals are actually served. So it could be a library, uh, could be a Boys and Girls Club. There's a lot of opportunities as to where the meals are being served. Um, and the, you know, the general premise is that they should be in areas that are serving a high population of low-income kids. So I think in, in the simplest sense, um, summer meals are, are so great because we know that food brings people together. And I'm sure that in many of your communities, um, your agencies and your cities and counties have been hit hard by budget cuts. So summer meal programs really provide a great opportunity to bring community partners together to really identify who has what to bring to the proverbial table. Um, and as you can see here, I've, I've created just a short list of, of who you can help bring to the table, ranging from schools and food banks um, to healthcare practitioners. There really is no end to who can be brought to the table to really kind of um, see what kind of creative endeavors can be developed to support uh, youth in your community. Um, and just to give you a few brief examples from here in California, here in Bakersfield, the school district worked with its the nutrition services worked with its academic department to develop uh, summer learning materials that were distributed to kids before they left for the summer, and then they were encouraged to come to the school cafeterias during the summer, which were nice air conditioned learning labs that had access to tutors and computers, along with a free healthy breakfast and lunch. Um, in the Bay Area, we had the YMCA working with residents from Stanford Medical School to really connect the health and health care piece and help um, jointly operate a summer meal program. Um, in the Redwood Empire Food Bank, they do a lot around nutrition education. So in addition to providing summer meals, they were also to, able to really work with kids and their families to learn about gardening and how to develop healthy habits at home. One of the projects that I'm just going to briefly touch on that I'm really excited about that we've been working on in California is our Lunch, in the library, lunch at the Library project. So what that is is we developed the California Summer Meal Coalition developed a statewide partnership with the California Library Association um, and with the support of the David and Lucille Packard Foundation. And really what we wanted to do was identify how we could bring together public library summer reading and other programs with the summer meals. And so we worked with various communities um, throughout California um, to partner to create different models of how we could bridge that summer learning and summer nutrition gap. And uh, we had really great success. Um, we started with just a few libraries in 2013, and now we will be working with nearly 45 libraries in California. And, and I bring this up really as just an example of how we can create these summer safety nets um, to ensure that kids are healthy and engaged in summer and that that gap doesn't happen. Um, and we will have, um, right now we are developing an online clearinghouse of information that can help libraries that are interested in either uh, becoming summer meal sites or really working as a promotional partner. And, and one of the things that I, I really wanted to mention in bringing up this example is that there are a lot of different ways to create partnerships, either in bringing programming to summer meal sites or acting as a promotional partner. And I think that's one of the ways that, um, that all of you can get involved is uh, really thinking about how you can either partner with summer meal providers or how you can help promote them. Because we really have a great need um, for trusted messengers to help get the word out about summer meal programs. So here is my contact information. And I am happy to um, help provide more information um, on either libraries and how they can get involved in summer meal programs. Um, I, I noticed that one of you in the chat indicated you were looking for information that might be able to help sway your director. And I think one of the important keys to remember about summer meal programs is that this is a real opportunity to help support your agency's goals as well. It's, 
it's really not just about serving meals. It's about um, working collaboratively with community partners. Um, so with that, I will pass it back to you, Crystal. But again, um, I hope you all are, are happy to reach out to me, and I'm happy to help in any way that I can. Great. Thank you so much, Patrice. I mean, that's just a, a, a gives us a really good overview of the summer meal program and the summer food service program, uh, especially for those on the call who are, this is new information for them, and uh, certainly sets the stage for what we're about to talk about. And and I love the way you talk about the the different types of programs that may be integrated into the the meal. Service and uh, and so uh, you know one thing that we actually want to think about is where might we reach uh, kids in the summer, whether it's for uh, providing the meals or uh, uh, providing information about the meals. And so I actually have another poll up for everybody, and I'd like to see um, uh, you know where in your community do you think kids are hanging out uh, when school is out, and you can check as many of these options as. Um, uh, as are applicable to your situation, uh, you know, is it a, a church community space or a daycare? Uh, are kids just hanging out at home, or do they go to the library or a park? Are they in school actually during the summer, or some type of summer learning program? Uh, what about YMCA's or rec centers, boys and girls clubs, that sort of thing? And then again, if it's other, uh, share in the chat exactly what it is that you think they're doing that that doesn't apply on this list, or maybe you've got a really specific example because uh, we'd like to hear that too. And and if you're not sure. That's okay, and I know some of you maybe are joining. You know, you're representing your entire state, or you're uh, here as an individual, and and this may not be a, a question that's easy for you to answer. And so that's okay if you don't know as well. Um, I see lots of answers coming in, and I'll I'll close the poll in just a minute. It looks like it's slowing down, so I'll do the countdown: five, four, three, two, and one, and we'll close that poll. Now you can see everybody's responses. And so it looks like definitely the uh, library uh, and the parks stand out on top. I know we have lots of libraries here today, um, so that's a great place to get information out to kids. And if you are a meal site as well, then even better. Uh, lots of activity at the YMCA's and rec centers, and also at home. So those are some of our biggest categories, and you can kind of see the, the spread there. So I, I know there are many places we find kids in the summer, and this just really gives us a lot to think about. Now Patrice also mentioned you know, some of the different things happening at uh, libraries in California this summer and the Lunch at the Library program. Well, now we're going to hear from uh, Michael, who is uh, at the Pueblo City County Library District in uh, Pueblo, Colorado. And he's going to talk about how they have been reaching youth in their community, both within the library and outside of the library. Uh, they are both a meal program site and a referral agency, and they're working on ways to increase staff training when it comes to making referrals to other meal sites. Uh, Michael? Crystal, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm, I will be talking about how the Pueblo City County Library District got involved with summer meals and some of the benefits that we have realized from this partnership. Uh, I'll share some concerns that staff have voiced to me which demonstrate a need for more awareness about access to summer meals. And I'll end by sharing how we are planning to better focus our efforts towards our role as a referral agency. Um, our introduction to the summer meal program came with our outreach department. Um, years ago, we developed a program called Satellite Libraries. Uh, these are locations within existing libraries, often school libraries, in which the public library uh, adds supplemental collections to provide access to materials for all ages and interests. And of course, we also provide other typical library programs, such as story times and other programs. Uh, many of these school locations were summer meal sites, and we were surprised to learn that even when the school year ends, school lunches may continue. Uh, we began partnering with the summer school lunch program, uh, meaning we just altered our program times as a way to build capacity of people participating in our own library programs, uh, and it was successful. Uh, then about 10 years ago, we initiated a seasonal program uh, in the summer called Books in the Park. Um, Books in the Park allows us to more directly reach our target audience of families, often of lower socioeconomic status who may not otherwise utilize library services. Uh, this may be because they are unable to travel to our brick and mortar locations or possibly because of the institutional nature of uh, a library building just may be intimidating. Uh, seeing our Books in the Park program as an entry point for people to begin using the library services more fully 
we changed the services a bit. We removed many of the barriers uh, to use that our more traditional library locations have. So no library card account is required. Uh, books circulate on an honor system, so there are no fines. Um, shoes and shirts are not required at our books in the park, <laughs> and uh, you're welcome to run and make noise. Uh, really what I found is that uh, books in the park it naturally emphasizes the fun, interest-driven model of engaging reading uh, that public libraries do so well. Um, as we began to develop the parks program, uh, we were able to build several new partnerships. Uh, the City Parks and Recreation Department, of course, uh, YMCA has started providing programming uh, at our locations. Um, community advocates such as politicians and TV personalities, they all jump at the chance uh, to read stories with children at these locations. It's just a fun, engaging way to participate in the summer. Um, and we were surprised to be approached by the school summer meals program, suggesting that we begin providing summer meals at our locations in the parks. And because we already had this existing relationship with the program, we had seen it uh, functioning kind of alongside of our services, we quickly said yes. Uh, and this is largely because we knew that uh, library with staff really would not be required to take on much work at all. Um, so here are the summer meals. Um, being a service point for summer meals really takes very little staff time. Each morning we communicate a prediction of how many meals we need, and this can vary greatly. Sometimes neighborhoods put together um, some events, and we know that many more people will be participating that day. Uh, so we phone in how many meals we, we think we'll need that day. And if we're off, uh, the meal sites will uh, bring more food in. Um, the food is then prepared in an approved kitchen. Uh, usually within uh, an area school in our case. And that staff then delivers it to our site. They serve um, the food. Um, and all we are required to do is to provide access to hand washing and disposal of trash. Easy enough. Uh, staff are required to take a, a brief online training about food safety. And what we get back is of tremendous value for our, for our own goals as well as for our customers as well. Uh, it's clear to us that many people show up to our parks in order to take advantage of these free meals. Uh, so we've planned programs, again, to coordinate with our meal times in order to increase that program attendance. Uh, you know, we know that schools are sending home flyers listing all of the community summer meal sites. And the great incentive of a meal, along with the marketing from schools, is a, a real win for our parks program. Last year, we served 3,000 people over the eight weeks of the program. Um, staff serving youth have told me that some youth seem to spend all day at the library, uh, sometimes asking people for money to purchase food from vending machines, or telling staff, I'm hungry. Uh, so our staff are, are aware of the need, um, but unaware that free meals are available throughout the community, staff have sometimes resorted to personally providing food that has happened, or they've consulted with me about whether or not it's time to get the Department of Social Services involved. And uh, you know, summer meals is a great solution. So learning about resources to find free meals has been a, a great solution for staff worried about the well-being of hungry youth. Uh, we've had one instance when a young customer came to a program that involved using food to build a diorama. We were, we were playing with our food. We were building stuff. And uh, this young customer requested uh, that they eat the food, and they didn't really want to participate in the building. Uh, piece of the program. And uh, you know, this really highlighted to us that there is a need for library staff to be more familiar with information resources regarding free meals. Uh, so in preparing for this presentation, I learned a lot. I learned that uh, few staff outside of those working directly it, with, with our books in the park locations or our satellite library locations, few staff are really aware of the summer meal service being provided. So this year, uh, we have a few action the actions planned in order to step up our ability to become a successful referral agency. Uh, first, we plan to be prepared to distribute paper flyers, the same paper flyers that the schools are distributing, um, listing the area summer meal locations. And I do want to note that, uh, you know, the, of course, the big disadvantage of paper is that paper is inevitably immediately out of date. Uh, the plus side of flyers is that they can stand as a physical reminder for staff to share the information, and they can also serve as uh, invitations for customers to inquire, to ask more questions. So uh, if we just got these out and about the library, they can come and ask us more questions. 
Um, each year, all staff are given a brief training about summer reading program activities, and summer meals is being added to the training this year. Uh, so uh, the training will include resources that are kept up to date, uh, such as hunger.org and an app called Range, which I know you'll be hearing more about. Um, both of these provide access to all of the available information about local meal locations. Uh, we're also working to bring more resources into our park locations uh, to share online access to this information. So in order to provide a hands-on experience with information available online, we're going to be bringing a hotspot to the parks, We'll be bringing a laptop and an iPad. Uh, so staff will be able to both demonstrate these resources and also help uh, our customers uh, find the resources on their own devices. So uh, that staff will be prepared to provide uh, mini tech trainings uh, surrounding the use of, these, uh, of, of the Range app and other online resources. Um, you know, one interesting problem of bringing technology to our parks, as we've been thinking this through, uh, just from our past experience, is the need to keep our devices cool as the temperatures rise. So we're planning on uh, filling a cooler with ice and you know, creating a, a barrier there, uh, but so that when our, if our devices uh, begin to overheat, we can throw those in the cooler and um, get them ready to, to keep rolling. Um, there is a discussion now uh, to bring summer meals to all of our library locations in the future. Uh, our experience has been nothing but positive, and in fact, um, We've learned some things about some of our own food programs and, and some of the regulations that we really should be following. Um, what, what we know is that food brings people together. Uh, stories and reading can then build experiences and grow knowledge. And it has been said, to feed the mind, start with the stomach. Uh, so to find our next eager readers, perhaps we can start by recommending a nice place to find a warm meal this summer. Uh, with that, I know Great. that I'll be uh, pass on the presentation. Great, thank you, Michael. And uh, that really is, is, you know, it shows us a great example of how a library can be involved. Uh, in your case, you are involved with the actual summer meal sites, but you can also be involved in just helping families and and children connect to meals. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so now we're going to move on to have uh, Marnie tell us how uh, several tools uh, t to tell us about several tools that are available to help make referrals uh, to summer meal sites, and she will tell us also some of the ways that you can help in your community. Marnie, thank you. So, so you heard um, about the issue of um, summertime meals for youth and, and making sure they have continuous access to food. I love Patrice's comment that kids are year-round beings and they need to eat during the summertime too. And you've heard about what one library is doing to engage not just by feeding meals but by engaging their librarians in giving solid referrals to other meal sites throughout their area. So what I'd like to talk about now are three different solutions that you can use to help make solid referrals in your community um, to youth who are seeking summertime meals. The first, and it's one Michael mentioned, is a website called Why. They run the National Hunger Hotline, and they have a, a database that you can access through any web browser that helps you find food. Um, you see what the database entry form looks like here on this page. It allows you to put in a, an organization name, an address, um, even just your state or your zip code, and to um, by uh, hitting the summer meals with the blue arrow just appeared next to it for search, you'll see those summer meal locations. Um, interestingly, I took some of, the, um, some of the places you all said that youth hung out during the summer. You mentioned that they hung out at home. I put in um, both apartment, uh, put in apartments into the search bar just to see nationwide how many sites had the word apartment in the title, 1,865 sites so far have signed up to serve summertime meals at apartments. There are 253 libraries serving summertime meals at this point, 192 mobile home parks, and 68 pools. Um, and this is with just the states that are reporting at this point. We aren't yet into summer, so states are still, still submitting their summer meal sites to Why Hunger. So more organizations go into that database every day. When I looked up libraries two weeks ago, for example, there were 172 
Um, and just a few minutes ago, there were 253. So those numbers that I just said are going to go up. So food is all over, and it is in places we may not think of as normal food sites. Um, also, on the Why Hunger website, you can find some flyers that you can download and you can post in your library. These are great, as Michael said, because they promote awareness. They don't have information on them that gets old or changes. Um, these include the Why Hunger Hotline. The wonderful thing about people call, families calling the hotline is that they have somebody that may answer their questions about summer meal sites, but help meet the other, other nutritional needs of the family as well, not just those summer meals for youth. So it's a terrific resource to make available, but also just to build awareness that there is help in the community. Um, an organization called Share Our Strength runs a campaign, No Kid Hungry, and they're working hard to help kids do what they call Save Summer by making sure that uh, communities rather save summer by making sure that kids that are facing hunger have, have appropriate access to meals. And one of the tools that they make available is a text message service. You simply text the word food to 877-877, and um, you get back a response that asks you for your address. You'll see in this instance when I was doing it, I just replied with a city and state name, and I got summer meal locations back. Um, I, I, as you can see, was using a smartphone whenever I did this, but you could do it from a fe feature phone as well. Anything that you can text from, you can text and get locations. This again is a wonderful resource to make available. Um, I want to emphasize um, as you go in and start to test and play with these tools that, that we are showing you that you, you, you may look at a state and you may find that, there, you know, find that there are very few summer meals available, two or five. Well, it's simply because that state hasn't submitted all of the summer meal sites yet. So that information comes in between now and approximately June 15th. So again, those numbers just increase. The other thing that I want to emphasize is the sites change locations over the course of the summer. So a site may only be open in the month of July, or it may only be open in August. They may be open for two weeks and find out that they need to adjust their hours or change their location because they aren't reaching the youth that they wanted to reach. That is one of the reasons that you should go back and check these often to make sure the information you have and you're using is current. The last tool I'm going to show you is the one that we developed with help from people like Patrice and Michael um, uh, called Range. Range is a mobile app that works on a smartphone and allows you to locate the nearest place where a youth can get a free summertime meal. And it looks the way you expect an app like this to look. Whenever you open your browser, it figures out where you are, or open the app on your phone, it figures out where you are, and gives you nearby meal locations. They're just shown with a pin uh, the way that you're looking, uh, what you're looking at now. And then you can tap on any one of those pins, and you can get a little bit more information. Whenever we look at range now, most of the sites say coming soon because summer hasn't started yet. So even though we may know where the site is, they haven't started serving summer meals yet in most places. You can tap on that again, and you can get more detail about the site. So it provides a description. In this case, we have the starting and end date. We have the days of the week that they're serving, and the times that they're serving. So it also gives you an opportunity to get directions or to call. Whenever you're looking at them, you can click the little share icon in the description, either in the full detail or the small detail, and you can start to collect um, collect sites, and then you can share those sites with somebody else via text message or email. The interface looks like what you see now, not your familiar text messaging or email interface. And it does that because we use third-party tools to, to share the information out. And that has a couple of advantages. One, the, um, it, the text message then or email goes to the recipient with a standard um, email address and text address, not your personal phone number or email address. Um, and it keeps the recipient's number from being stored on the phone. So it just provides a little bit of um, anonymity for both the sender and the receiver. So what, what do we hope happens as a result of 
community members engaging with the tools that we were sharing today? Well, the first thing that we want to do, all of us, is just increase the number of low-income youth who access summer meals. I will tell you, as somebody that was you know, four months ago a newcomer to this issue, I, I was shocked to learn how hard it is for kids and families to find out the places that they need to go to eat, and just the enormous opportunity that we have as community members to share that information. We hope to, sh to increase the number of youth who access it by making it exactly easier for people to share their information. We want to increase the amount of accurate referrals within the community. That's why we're reaching out to all of you today to share this information. We're very hopeful that you'll engage with these tools and you'll share the specific locations of summer meal sites with your community members. And then Finally, we hope that your engagement increases your knowledge about the Summer Meals program, allows you to think about different ways you might participate next summer, whether it's bringing programs to Summer Meal sites, being a Summer Meal site yourself, or just being more and more prepared to be able to offer good, solid recommendations to those in your community. I know that we have said in the chat, and I believe Crystal said at the opening, that we'll be sharing the resources with all of you after this, as well as many of the answers to your questions. But I did want to give you, um, just a, a show you in here the slide that gives you the link to the specific resources that I mentioned as a part of this. And um, we, we really hope that you will help save summer for millions of children by downloading and using these tools, bookmarking them on your computers, your public access computers and the computers that you use, and printing and posting these flyers so that people know that there are community resources available to them, and these school-age youth don't have to go hungry during the summertime. Great. Thank you, Marnie, for giving us such a thorough overview to those tech tools. And uh, now it is time to uh, do some questions and answers. And we've been getting a few, and I know lots of those answers have been actually coming through in the chat. Um, but before we do questions and answers, I do want to mention that, you know, to follow up on, on what Marnie just said about those resources coming through in, uh, in an archive email, which you'll get within 24 hours of the closing of the webinar today, um, you know, one of, uh, somebody asked questions about being able to download the app. And it is available in um, the three App stores for Windows, uh, Google Play, and uh, Apple, and the links to the pages in those app stores will be included in the archive email. So if you're having trouble finding it, um, that's one way you may be able to find it more easily. Um, also, I'll just say that if we aren't able to answer your question here on this call, maybe it might take us a little bit more research or we don't have time to get to all of the questions uh, because lots of good ones are coming through, then we will follow up with you via email. Um, and so, uh, you know. Uh, please do uh, add any questions that you have. Um, now, I know that uh, one of the, the questions we got, this is actually a really good one, you know, the, the emphasis of range and of many of the resources uh, that you just shared, Marnie, are on the uh, Summer Food Service Program for children. But is there any plan to expand the tech options to all food sites, not just those for children? Uh, do you know of any plans uh, that may exist for that in the future? Sure. The Why Hunger website that I showed you does have a robust series of food sites for adults and children and, you know, all throughout the nation. And the Hunger Hotline also provides information about other food sites. Um, I don't know of that we can look up and find out any other uh, either mobile or texting options that provide um, comparable access to other ongoing food sites or food resources so we can find that and, and follow up with you. I'll, I'll be frank, when we started looking at this issue and the big um, bundle of hunger-related needs in, the, in this country, the, the place where we saw the, the single biggest deficit and provide the most resource was on this, this gap that you face during the summertime. And so that's the place that we started our exploration. But we've been learning a lot in this process. And hope to be able to package other resources that provide access to information that youth may need for other reasons and that um, adults may need in terms of food. 
Great. All right. Well, it's good to know there are at least a, a few other resources out there that exist currently, and, and there may be some others coming along as the technology improves for that. Um, now, uh, another question that we've been having is, um, you know, how do we know? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. How um, how can one become a summer feeding site, a summer meal site? And while that wasn't the emphasis of this uh, webinar today, because for many states we're actually right at the deadline right now to join, um, I, I will say that in the archive email we are including that information uh, so that you can find out more uh, about who your state contacts are and and find out about getting involved if it's too late this year, then potentially for next year. And uh, you know, it's good to see that there is is interest for people uh, on this call today for getting involved. And Patrice, I just want to ask, is there anything that you want to add to that for those who might be interested in becoming a partner as a meal site in the future? Sorry, it took me a minute to unmute myself. Um, I, you know, I think I would just recommend connecting with um, the state agencies that will be provided in the follow-up email that you're sending out would probably be your best option, as well as connecting with your state anti-hunger advocates. Great. Great. And uh, Patrice, I've got another question for you. I think you might be able to answer this one best. You know, there have been a couple of questions related to how many kids show up at the site or how many kids might be eligible in an area. And I think there's also an underlying question there, which is, is how do you know that you're not sending somebody to a site that uh, isn't going to have enough meals available? That you know, What do sites do if they get more uh, kids in a day that they had anticipated? Uh, what do they do to meet that need? Um, so to address your first question as far as uh, predicting participation, you know, it really varies on the site. I think that, you know, for an organization like a library, they tend to know, um, you know, how many, roughly how many kids they, they usually come in during the summer, so they have a pretty good sense. Um, largely, it, it's a bit of a guessing game, so I think initially when summer meal sites, whether they're libraries or some other nonprofit or a park site, it, it's a little bit of a guessing game. And you really have to kind of um, ballpark, you know, what you had the previous day and adjust your orders. Um, yeah, so it, it, can, it can be a challenge. Um, but I think that's partly why libraries make great sites is that they typically have a better sense of how many kids come in during summer and they can do outreach based on that. Like if they have a, a standard number of kids that come in and that meets, you know, the space that they have to feed, um, they don't have to do a lot of outreach. But yeah, it really does depend. And, and realistically, there are days um, when you may run out of meals. And I think for most summer meal sites, um, families are, are pretty accepting of hearing, you know, uh, just come back tomorrow. Uh, we'll we'll be serving again tomorrow. I think you know uh, families understand that, but um, that's kind of part of part of how the program works. Great, thank you. And uh, Michael, do you have anything to add to that? Having been at an actual meal site, do you have any experience on that front? Yeah, uh, I saw uh, somebody here in the chat recently posted that, uh, and, and this was my experience as well. There have been occasions when um, we ran out of meals and the staff were able to go back to the, the kitchen and bring some food back with them. We've never had to turn people away, uh, and, and maybe we've been lucky, but uh, I agree we were able to predict um, fairly well how many people to expect, but in those rare occasions when we've run out of food, the staff were able to uh, get back to the kitchen and, and bring some back. Great, great. So yeah, it sounds like it really depends on the site, but everybody's in the position of doing the best that they can and then adapting uh, as things change. So um, Michael, we have a question for you about uh, uh, staff training. Um, now you said that you were um, you know, going to be doing some staff training and integrating it into your summer reading program training. Um, but what are the specific types of things you might try to train staff on, and how might you pass that information on to them? Um, you know, we have people here of all different size uh, organizations, and um, so if you have any tips on how to pass on that, that information, it would be helpful. Sure. Um, it, our, our plan this year is uh, every year about now as we approach summer reading, uh, 
one of the staff in, in par participating in that summer reading program will make it to every department meeting and you know we talk briefly about how the program works and we're, we're including in that um, that staff training this year information about uh, how to find information about the summer meals uh, so that we can um, make sure that we can pass that on to customers as they need it. And um, as I said, sometimes just having those, those paper flyers around keeps it at the top of our mind and at the customer's fingertips. And, and um, they often will um, ask us questions based on what the types of things that we've got lying around the library as well. Um, I, I think the, the biggest element of training for our staff this year is going to be for the staff who are at the park locations, um, ensuring that they're uh, comfortable using the, the, the devices and uh, um, understanding how, how to identify when we may need to cool them down. We, had, we don't have experience there yet, but uh, just ensuring that they're uh, comfortable. Because I, I, the fear is that they're going to be getting questions not just about the range app, um, but uh, all types of questions about the device. So really, we're needing to get them comfortable to, um, to, to demonstrate the technologies uh, for other purposes as well. Great, great. All right. So yeah, it sounds like you've got a couple of different things up your sleeve. And I just also want to refer back to our archive that's going to be coming out. We have several links there that have um, some frequently asked questions and some other informational sites, both that come from the USDA and then also from the Why Hunger and, um, and other sites that we've shared with you. So uh, there will be many uh, resources with additional information there. Now one question that's been asked is uh, uh, Trina asked, if, is there a place to find out statistics and I'm guessing this is about your local area on the, the number of children that qualify for free or reduced lunches. And so I don't know if, uh, Patrice, if you happen to know of any places where we might find statistics. I think that the easiest uh, way to get that information is to contact your school district nutrition services department. Um, usually they'll use School data is the best way to um, figure out how you know kind of whether or not your um, agency is located in an eligible area, um, and you can also use census data as well. And um, Crystal, we can connect to make sure that that information is in the archive that's sent out. Great. Great. Yeah, and I know in this day and age we're so used to being able to just search online and, and find that information, but sometimes it's actually easier to pick up the phone and call somebody or, or get in touch with our local contacts uh, because that statistic may not be online. So that's great advice. Um, and can, another I add, question. can I add one more oh, point yeah. to that? So, yes. um, so summer meal sites also need to be separated by a certain geographic distance too. So while your agency may fall in an eligible area, it's important to um, talk with your school district or, or whomever um, to make sure that there isn't already a summer meal site nearby. So, so that's something to think about too when you're looking at eligibility. Great, great. Good advice there as well. And actually we have a question from Sam who asks, if non-USDA sponsored sites, I'm imagining meal sites, can those be submitted to the state? And better yet, can they be submitted to these uh, tools like Why Hunger, these data sets that are um, being uh, aggregated and used for these amazing tools? Uh, Marnie, I'm going to pass this one to you. Sure. So why Hunger, the USDA doesn't mandate but strongly encourages that all of the states submit their data about summer meal sites to Why Hunger so that it can be more easily accessed and found. And in, in fact, last year it, it was a pretty robust listing of all of the summer meal sites. So that is typically submitted by the state coordinators, which differs by by the states exactly who and which department that is. And um, that's part of the follow-up information that we can share. Um, an easy way, you, you, you can easily look, search in the Why Hunger database by simply typing in your state name. And it will give you just a quick glimpse of whether or not the sites have been submitted. If you have a large state and you see only two sites, available, then you, you can trust that your sites haven't yet been submitted by the state coordinator. If you do see a critical mass of, of summer light sites in there, hundreds or thousands of summer meal sites in there, you, you, you can look for those in specific communities. And then contact your summer meals coordinator if you feel that some of the sites are missing. Um, an important thing to remember is what, 
the, as I said, the sites change location over the course of the summer. So you might have or there might be a summer meal site that's operating in August. It may be a while before that one shows up. Some of the states are pretty good about keeping their data, um, the site data very accurate. And so they take down old sites and put up new sites. So it does change over the course of the summer. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, I have time for just one more question before we move into our wrap-up. And Marty, I'm going to direct this one to you as well, because you just presented us with, with um, you know, three tools, but really it's more than that because some of the uh, sites also have the hot, you know, Why Hunger has the hotline, and um, uh, Share Our Strength, no, no Kids Hungry has the text tool. Um, and, and what are the, um, you know, when we're dealing with all of these tools, sometimes it's easy for us, especially if we're in a small organization and we're handling all of this technology and these phone numbers and these websites, to uh, make a decision in a moment about what's the best way to use one of these tools. Which tool do you use in a situation um, to help refer a youth um, uh, to a meal site or a family to a meal site? Um, and do you have any tips for people just to uh, you know, kind of in the moment decide which tool they should use or how to keep them all on hand and available? Any tips on, in that area? Sure thing. I think whenever you're in the library and you have access to your desktop computers and the computers that are available for patrons, using the Why Hunger database makes the most sense. It's accessible via a browser. The Internet connection is already there. Um, it's easy to segment out the summer meal sites and find directions. You may be able to print from the library so you can print. And Stan, that's probably the easiest tool for a librarian to use to make a referral or help somebody find a place on a public access computer when they're inside the library. And the same may be true in any other kind of organization that um, has a client that's asking for help. As you probably do have a computer or laptop at your desk, that you can quickly use the um, Why Hunger database to find food. I think if you're out in the parks, you're outside <clears throat> of your building helping people, that's when the mobile tools, having those already loaded and ready to go on your phone, your mobile devices, and know how to use them, that's what's going to make the most sense because um, it keys into where you are. And it um, is a quick and easy way for you to get the information out of your pocket. So I think those are the two tools that we as community members can best use to find the referral information and then share in the way that's appropriate to the individual that we're talking to in the place that, where we're at. I think if we have, are answering questions about people about what resources can they take with them, to be able to find the lunch sites on their own, we can refer them to range and to the Why Hunger database. But I honestly think the most, two most robust tools in that way are the um, text messaging service that we shared as a part of this, but also the Why Hunger hotline because that gives you a person on the other end that helps with more of your needs. And while it can be hard for people to get on the phone with a stranger and ask for help like that, it is um, very much um, a resource that can provide them with more than just what they asked for um, and, and point them to resources that they may not know exist. So I think you divide it up by the location out and about. Use a mobile app um, in your office, in a public location where you have desktop or laptop computers with Internet access. Use the Why Hunger database. And you want to refer the patrons to things. Those two are good services, but probably the hotline and the text messaging service are the best. Excellent, excellent. That's an excellent breakdown for us to, to walk away with today. And that leads us right into our, our wrap-up. Um, and so thank you, Marnie, um, for, for that uh, great explanation. Um, but as we are about to wrap up, first of all, I'll ask those of you who are still on the line with us, stay on the line because we'll have a survey for you at the end where you can tell us what you thought about today's webinar. Um, and, and in the meantime, I want you to just think about what, what did you learn today and what tools are going to be most helpful for you in whatever situation you are in. And then lastly, what is it that you're going to do next? We're all in different positions of power in our organizations or maybe working as individuals. Um, but just think of some of the things you can do. Can you tell youth and their families about uh, summer meal sites? Can you download the Range app? 
um, bookmarking that whyhunger.org and share our strength websites. Um, and, and then most importantly, um, you know, share this information that you got today with others in your organization or other uh, colleagues you know from uh, uh, other organizations outside of yours, other community partners you may be aware of, other nonprofits and faith-based orgs and libraries. Um, I do hope that you learned a few new things today to take with you and a reminder that that archive email will come out. And in that, look for a handout that lists some of the things you can do right now and things you might be able to do next year as well to be uh, helpful in this area. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers today, uh, Marnie, Michael, and Patrice for sharing their expertise, and also to those of you assisting on the chat with the many questions that we got in and comments that we got in today. Um, thanks to ReadyTalk for being a sponsor, and thanks to all of you for joining us. Uh, please stay on the line again to take a brief survey about your experience today, which will help us improve our webinar offerings in the future, and have a great day.